I, without a lot of context or preamble, am going to read to you from the first chapter of my book. We've been tasked, Alyssa and I, with thinking about identity. And so I hope that what I have to read you sets the context for the talk tonight and also illuminates a little bit about what I've been thinking about. Everyone has a story. This story is both mine and that of others, the members of my family and of my tribe, the Cowlitz. This is a story about stories too, about how people use stories to define who they are. This story is partially mine and partially theirs. My book began as a hunt for stories, a personal journey to discover the lost songs and histories of my grandmothers of the Cowlitz tribe. Along the way, I realized that these stories were not just my aunties or my grandmothers, but they were the stories of the Cowlitz people themselves. And in finding the stories, I was finding the identity of a tribe scattered across various states, a tribe until recently without a land, a tribe whose sense of identity was constantly in danger of dissolving into the blankness of unrecorded history, except for the very heroic and shiroic efforts of numerous of its people. So my search took me to reservations in Washington State. It had me going to cemeteries and doing gravestone rubbings, which my children to this day hate. They hate cemeteries because I took them to so many of them. Um, it took me to the living room of a dying linguist in Canada. It made me some good friends among my family. And by an odd twist of fate, it got me an administrative job in the Cowlitz tribe. As I searched and as I learned I was in museums, I also was falling in love with my grandmothers and with my ancestors. Now, I always had questions about where I came from, but they became more urgent when I was a young mom. Once I had children, part of what you want to pass on is what you believe to be true about your family and yourself. Um, these questions became pressing when I was a grad student, too. Early in my graduate studies, I befriended a guy named Andy, and Andy seemed to have a really good handle on being Indian. He just, you know, he had flaxen hair and he had icy blue eyes, but he was connected personally and socially and politically to the Siletz tribe of whom he was a member. And this identity for him was a launching point for a lot of the things he accomplished in graduate school and a lot of the people he alienated. Um, he fought the racist policies at the institution where I went to school and he walked the walk and he did the ceremony, he kept up native practice. I, on the other hand, felt like I was really bad at being Indian. I always knew that I had native blood and I was always told that I was Cowlitz and Cree. My grandma lived on the Siletz Reservation. All of my relatives were enrolled in the Cowlitz tribe, but my mom didn't participate and didn't enroll her kids, right? So she didn't take the time either to demonstrate what being Indian meant, though later I was to understand that how she lived and the way in which she lived helped me to understand what it meant to be a native woman and to realize how deeply culture is actually embedded in our daily practices and in our lives. In my early 20s, I took it upon myself to enroll myself in the Cowlitz tribe. I called the tribal office and I put together the genealogies and the application for membership and I was accepted in 1990. It was in this context that Andy, my Siletz cohort, and I had a long talk one day. And I confessed to him how diffident I felt and how awkward I felt about being a Cowlitz and Cree woman. But he asked me, he sat me down, he had a lot of empathy, and he said, what is it for you? 
And I told him that I felt physically, palpably pulled to remember and to hold that memory. What does it mean to be a Native American person, to be a Cowlitz? And he smiled and he said that since I felt like I ought to remember, that I was probably, or maybe even definitely, an Indian of sorts. And it was this sorts that made me start looking at my heritage. And what I found was that in 1841, my Cree ancestors came to the Cowlitz Prairie in Washington Territory. They were voyageurs, fur transporters, and they were in the employ of the Hudson's Bay Company. They traveled the prairie from the Red River area in Manitoba, and then they came down, like a lot of Cowlitz people's ancestors, from that area into Washington Territory. And they settled, and they quickly intermarried the Cowlitz people. And the Cowlitz tribe welcomed them, and even in legal processes, recognized them as part of the Cowlitz tribe. They also intermarried with a Cowlitz ancestor, Lucy Sklautwoot, or Hakire. So I come from the Cowlitz and I come from the Cree. My great-grandmother, Rose, spoke French Cree, and she also spoke Lower Cowlitz. But she censored herself, and even when I would, I would beg her, actually. She, my great-grandmother, had a lot to do with raising me, and she wouldn't speak Salish to me she would occasionally speak a little French. So while I learned Amor, I didn't learn the language of my tribe. So the story that's mine now is this mix of histories. It's my own ancestry and the history of the Cowlitz tribe since both histories are closely intertwined. And that's how this journey began. I wanted to know what it meant to be Cowlitz and Cree, and how not just me, not just myself, but how we all belonged. Because the Cowlitz tribe had no land base or reservation until January of this year, its people are scattered over southwestern Washington and other areas of the United States. Cowlitz General Council, which is held twice annually, provides an important venue and a gathering where people present and, and also communicate, and so I started going regularly to general council meetings. It was here that I became interested in the content of my book and also in the key question of my book, which was about matters of voice and authority. I started paying attention to whose voice was heard in general council meetings and whose story seemed to me to be ultimately being told, and how these stories and storytellers shaped for me and others at the council meeting a tribal identity. I would write a book to more fully understand these narratives, thinking about how Cowlitz leaders articulate and understand themselves and their history, and hence, by means of their authority, they bring understanding to the crowd, to the rest of the Cowlitz who are gathered there. I started taking notes and watching how the tribal user, leaders use different rhetorical strategies to demonstrate tribal priorities. And I wondered, what did these strategies tell me about group making and identity? Think of Fox News, folks. How many people are profoundly influenced by Fox News and, and then they sort of take on an identity or a way of speaking that reflects what it is that they're hearing? I in no way want to compare the Cowlitz to Fox News. <laughs> Just let's make that clear. And yeah, a content in a place where you gather and you want to find out more is a very important venue and place to be. You will absorb the information and you will internalize it and you will reflect it back. And if your identity is Cowlitz, that begins to happen almost magically, but for the people who led the tribe, very intentionally, I found. So the Cowlitz people have had to endure and surmount the forces of erasure that are common to all tribes of the United States. They suffered fatal disease and lost their numbers by the 1850s up to 80%. They were removed from their land and because of economic necessity, they had to move into jobs, right? Different from the jobs that they may have once had. 
They also had to suffer the cultural loss created as a result of cooperation with dominant culture, which was often racist in policy, if not in deportment. Given these pressures, one way the Cowlitz could articulate and maintain their identity was by defining themselves as different from prevailing or white culture. They did this in part by maintaining an attachment to their land and through a reliance on their leadership, a leadership that had both or who has both engaged the federal government at every turn and who has also carefully marked and rehearsed Cowlitz's collective memory. And I'm going to break from this reading for just a second to say, has anybody had the pleasure of being a tribal leader or in connection to tribal leaders? Just a show of hands. I know a whole bunch of you are sitting right in front of me, right? Not only do you have to know what the heck about your tribe, but you also have to be a, a, a generalist and yet an expert in so many things, whether it's housing or poverty or education or government. You have to know that and get yourselves together, speak compellingly and interface with the federal government. So this engagement and this requirement of tribal leaders is tremendous, right? It's like if you swooped into a town of 3,000 people and decided that everyone there could, you know, engage with the federal government on um, real complexities and do it well. But tribes do, and the Cowlitz tribe has. So I was fascinated by this engagement and by how that formed and bolstered who the Cowlitz people were. So I'm going to go back to attachment to land. This attachment is especially important for the Cowlitz tribe, who though it has tribal sites in Longview, the Seattle area, and Toledo, all in Washington state, hadn't until January of this year a formal land base or reservation. And its people, although they were concentrated in southwestern Washington, are scattered over other areas of the US. And because of this lack of centrality, the Cowlitz General Council, which I mentioned is held twice annually, is is an important venue for gathering and communicating. I started going regularly. The first meetings I attended were very overwhelming for me personally. I sat among probably about 200 Cowlitz people and I looked something like them right down to the round tea-colored eyes. I heard the chairman, John Barnett, speak of the trials of his people, my people, and how they prevailed. I saw history finally alive in front of me on this modest stage at General Council, and I saw the old ones sitting quietly. I saw ceremony, and I heard their voices raised in common, and it was very, very potent and very powerful. I'm intellectually curious, so I was inclined first to look at books for what I needed, but books can only do so much. And quiet myths upon a page can't live in the way that a myth or a story told in context truly can. So I listened carefully to the spiritual elder, Roy Wilson, as he told stories of Coyote or the Deer Sisters or other mythical figures. I wondered as I sat there, a young woman, curious and impressionable, listening to the leaders talk and watching the panel of tribal council members who sat before me. Intellectually, I understood the complications of my position as a woman of European and Native American mixed ancestry and descent. I understood the implications of claiming space and place as my own, and I understood as I sat at general council, and even though this was swimming in my head, in my heart, and in my body, I felt utterly, totally at home. It was during general council, watching Chairman Barnett and Roy Wilson lead the proceedings that I became captivated by articulations of Native identity that existed aside and along the more formal articulations of Native identity that stemmed from anthropological research, which I was finding super inadequate as I was doing my research. My project of discovery began not so much with a concern for a cultural renaissance as with a need to hear the stories of the elders and the mythology of the tribe 
What was our inheritance, I wondered. What did we tell one another and why, right? How do you identify? These questions refined themselves as I emerged, as I immersed myself deeper into the research. I listened to the leaders and through their guidance, shared knowledge, I began to make sense of the political struggle that lay at the heart of Cowlitz's history and hence of Cowlitz's identity. I began to question the way in which Cowlitz's tribal people, and especially the leaders, understood themselves as enduring. Enduring against the constraints of the government, enduring against the passage of time, against erosion, against all odds since time immemorial. And again, I'll back up. Until January of 2002, the Cowlitz were not a federally recognized tribe. And to stick together and to make it happen and to do the work it requires to become federally recognized required um, tons of time and effort and, you know, the kind of resources that tribal people often don't have, but they did it. As I studied, my focus narrowed to the question of the contemporary response to the historical pressures created by the Cowlitz relationship to their own history. This history occurred both in relationship to the federal government through cooperations with its mandates and its processes, as well in it as in other more somber places, a fragmentary memory of an elder story or a last Sahaptan word whispered. What, I would ask repeatedly, did the leaders seem to know that taught them how to be cowlets? Was it the stories learned at the knees of elders 70 years ago, or the education gained by traveling back and forth to Washington, D.C., to deal with Congress and with select committees? Was it about the time spent in the woods or at the medicine wheel or the time spent pacing before a senator's door, hoping that you get five minutes with that person? And the answer is yes, and yes, it was all of these things. Where, I wondered, did tribal leaders get their understanding and what did they know about their ancestors and being Indian? What did they, many of them multiracial and multicultural like me, why did they choose to identify with their native heritage rather than other ones? As I learned more about the Cowlitz tribe, I began to filter my own experience through the new information that I received. And I discovered that I'd been raised to do by my mother and my grandmothers. It was rooted in learned experience, an experience shared with other Cowlitz and Cree people. So as I began to do my research and talk, I realized that my family was not isolated in its life ways. And it consisted of cultural practices that were transmitted really informally over time. There was certainly a case to make for Native identity existing in the motions of my life, for my many summers that were spent in the Cascade Mountains picking berries or digging clams and harvesting mussels by the Pacific Ocean. You know, I used to grumble because my mother would drag us out to the most kind of haggard and remote logging roads where the briars were grown over and the very special blackberries. There was a very specific sort. I can't even talk about it. <laughs> but we had to, you know, we'd just get the hell scratched out of us and we'd have to pick these berries for hours and it was really scorching heat. And in any case, that was my life. I thought that's what all kids did, but it was not what all kids did. Um, though my working class parents lived really comfortably, our trips to the grocery store were only slightly more common than our forest trips that yielded a harvest of venison and berries. So, not long ago, still thinking about how place and the motions of everyday shape and reinforce identity, I wrote these words. That America is a state, but I and my people are a state of being. I am born here, and I grow here. And I find that being American occupies being both Native American and European. I have at least those identities and many more. Being for many Native Americans is being upon the land 
And again, if you think about it, if you are in place for any amount of time, you begin to relate in that place, you know where the food is, or if you're in the city, you know where the coffee is, right? And you know how to get around, and your life begins to shape and respond to the environment. And imagine if you did that for 10,000 years, right? Um, Give Starbucks a whole new meaning. So, critic Arjuna Potterai contends that locality or landedness is always vulnerable, not merely becomes it, because it becomes under siege in modern societies, but because being local is inherently fragile in the most intimate, spatially confined, isolated situations, locality and being in place must be maintained very carefully against the odds because things in life and seasons change. In America, the land is regulated. For the common person, and certainly for the ancestors and the people of my Cowlitz tribe, the categories of regulation imposed by land claims, for example, were a violence to be negotiated but not avoided. It is only by force that these sort of lines, these arbitrary lines are drawn upon lives. My great-grandma Rose was raised in southwestern Washington during the time of a great European influx. She welcomed strangers who newly dwelled on the land beside her, but she also didn't accept the artificial categories of land ownership imposed upon her. During the fish wars, does anybody know about those? Some of you know about that. She would fish, because you could be arrested for it if you weren't you know, in the right place at the right time. And to feed her family, she would secret the fish inside of her waders and then just wade out, wade it down <laughs> with the fish. So while she was a very welcoming person, right, as she intermarried with the settlers, she also wasn't always, she was a great rule breaker, as I think probably many of us are. So, she chose instead to assert her own set of rules and what I call traveling stories across the lines of maps. She strode rivers, swam paths, and picked the forest fern for a livelihood. She spoke languages too, and these as well travel across the lines of maps. Like my great-grandmother Rose, I find the rules of state often don't map to my personal understanding of rightful inhabitants upon the land. I refuse conceptual categories that confound or discount my lived experience, and I would refuse them on your behalf as well. I continue as my great-grandmother did to thrive on the land, and I gladly welcome new strangers who also dwell here. And while I eschew a romantic spiritualism or spiritual environmentalism that's very often associated with Native people, Um, I do feel that the relationship to the land is as rightful as any law. Those of us who love this land wander deep in the woods and wade in remote ancestral rivers. And when we do so, we remember and imagine who we are and who we were, and we act accordingly. Thank you. Christine, thank you so much for that wonderful reading. I just love Christine's book. Um, It's really, really important to me. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, Thanks to all family and friends um, who are here. It's good to see you. Um, Thanks so much to Karen and Chris for that warm welcome. And um, thanks to UW Press and uh, especially Natasha for getting us together, getting us here. This is just a really special event for me. Um, It's just really wonderful to be here talking with Christine. Um, So again, my name is Alyssa Washuda. I'm gonna read to you tonight from My Body is a Book of Rules. It's my memoir. I'm gonna read, um, (coughs) excuse me, some sections from the book that are, they're little, little tiny sections, a page or two at most. 
um, and they come in between the other chapters of the book, and each one is titled A Cascade Autobiography. So I don't want to talk too much about them. Um, all you really need to know is that I'm enrolled Cowlitz. I'm a citizen of the Cowlitz tribe. I'm also descended from the Cascade people. And uh, you should probably also know that I was born and raised in New Jersey, and I've been I've actually been here in Seattle for about seven years now, but at the time of this, the writing, the, when the book is set, I had just been in Seattle for a year or two and had just, just started being an active citizen in the Cowlitz tribe. Thomas begat Mary, who begat Abby, who begat Kathleen, who begat Leslie, who begat Alyssa. I look white. You might think that means I am white. You are wrong. I have a photo ID that says official tribal and above my official Indian grin. You know it's a legit tribal ID because the photographer didn't tell me to wipe the smile off my face. I suffer from gallbladder disease of which Indians are at particular risk. I look vaguely Indian when I wear maroon and grow my hair long. Why can't the one drop rule apply to me? I don't have just one drop of Indian blood. Half my skull is Indian, or my two hands, one neck, made of the same doomed substance as Tummuth's. When I tell people I'm native, they often ask, how much? It seems to be a reflex, the way when I'm asked how I'm doing, I always fib that I'm fine. I don't know why anyone cares to know my quantum, but I never want to be rude. I am 330 seconds Indian, 116th Cascade, and 132nd Cowlitz. Since the Cascade tribe has been split into pieces, I am enrolled Cowlitz. When the Cascade leaders were hanged, all the other Cascade Indians were rounded up by Lieutenant Phil Sheridan, put on an island, and told that they would be shot if they tried to leave. You know Sheridan because you've heard the only good Indian is a dead Indian. He was talking about me because he was talking about Indians like my great-great-great-grandpa, Thomas whom he hanged on March 28, 1856. Thomas was survived by his wives and daughters. Mary Wilwiety, or Indian Mary, is the daughter whose blood eventually became mine. If you're asking me who the Indian was who made me Indian, I guess you're asking about Mary, because she was the last full blood in my family line. Her second husband, Louis, Abby's dad, was Cowlitz. He was born to Lucy Scloutwout, a lower Cowlitz woman whose descendants fill many chairs at council meetings. Mary was a very young girl when her dad died. Her sister, Wylick Quiuk, of Virginia, was about nine at the time. When their dad was hanged, those little girls were enslaved and the world was upended, never to be set right again. When I was five, the kindergarten teacher split the class into pilgrims and Indians with construction paper costumes to teach us about our national heritage. My parents had explained to me that I was Indian, and the classroom taught me what this meant. When I was six, my dad taught me how to spell cowlitz, and I wrote it at the bottom of my drawings. When I was seven, 
I became obsessed with mermaids. Certain that I could fuse my legs into a fin if I pressed them together firmly enough under my modest sub-desk plaid. At eight, I created dioramas of buildings where other Native people's ancestors slept. And though the teacher told me that this was my heritage, I was not certain that I believed in cacti or mesas, having never seen them. In college, I tried telling stories that weren't mine. I showed up pale and brilliantly bare-limbed to my honors dorm toward the end of a hot mid-Atlantic summer. And when word got out about my scholarship, kids said, haven't the Indians already mooched off this country enough with their casino building and slipping loose from tax paying? I burrowed into the library and made scattershot efforts to learn what I could about Indian things. Languages, histories, stories, and I created my own fictions from them, hoping to prove myself that way, if I carried no proof within me. I thought I was a full half native and a full half Ukrainian until I was about 10. How, uh, the simple question of how much the wish to split someone's ancestry into neat compartments can actually tear a person limb from limb. I wouldn't know it until reaching graduate school, but the tendency to divide Indian ancestry into numerical parts is far from natural. It has been written into American law since the colonial period. Now, as a condition of enrollment, Many tribes require individuals to demonstrate a minimum degree of ancestry, known as blood quantum. Once I figured that out, it took me even longer to understand that blood quantum has nothing to do with blood. There is no such thing as Indian albumin, Irish hemoglobin, Ukrainian leukocytes, or French platelets. The veins and arteries do not split in those who are mixed and the blood does not contain the oily and watery liquids of disparate ethnicities. Blood is just a metaphor, and it's not much of one. Looking beyond the fractional diminishing from generation to generation, I began to wonder whether the blood does contain something real, an essence that cannot be neatly halved. I learned in science class that some genetic material is passed down through the mitochondrial DNA, which live in women's eggs. This was the limit of my understanding. Instead of researching this nugget's veracity, I chose to seize upon it, believing it meant that my core had been formed by elements handed down from woman to woman through the generations, like a scepter. I reasoned that something in me holding court in every cell was truly indigenous. How that hidden co code manifested in my outward form, though, was hard to say. In summer, my skin tanned easily. I would admire the contrast between my fingers and the white flesh between them because by December, I'd be even paler than many of, my, of the Euro-American kids at my school, especially the ones whose families had come over from Italy a few generations back. The only Indians I'd ever seen were the ones I was related to, the ones in the movies, and the ones who danced at the powwows held, held every summer of my childhood on the grounds of a winery 10 minutes away from my house. My mother, brother, and I would spend all year being the only Indians around, as far as we knew. In July, Indians from all over would converge at the local powwow, bringing with them beads and feathers, suede and abalone, weave and fringe. I wondered what they had been born with that I hadn't, since we were all Indian, yet they had these steps in them, these rhythms, 
these fur wraps and plumes that made them seem part bird and part otter. I wondered whether I would grow up to be Indian like that. I thought I might be part animal too, part guinea pig, hamster, crayfish, cat, all my pets, because we got so along so well together when we played, and they understood me better than any of my classmates. Still, before I was old enough to know what Indian meant, I knew we were produced in at least two varieties. I was unlike the powwow people who came from elsewhere. I asked my mother where I could learn to dance, like that. And she said she didn't know. Toward the end of college, after some of my peers had learned about the Buffalo Massacre and Wounded Knee and the Trail of Tears and experienced the liberal arts awakening, I began to get tired of hearing Oh, you're Native American? Man, I'm so sorry for what my people did to your people. It really sucked. As though that thing were so far in the past that people could solve it through apology, claiming the guilt that they thought no living person really bears. On the upside, after freshening and enlightenment, nobody gave a shit about my scholarship. Thomas was the first chief of the Watlala Band of the Tumwaters, also known as the Cascade Indians, a band of survivors left behind after an 1829 epidemic of ague fever that killed off most of the area's native population in a single summer. In 1855, at age 25 or so, Thomas signed a treaty in which he and many other signers gave up much of their land. They would move to the Grand Ronde Reservation, and although the U.S. pledged to provide food and supplies and even education, Thomas didn't live long enough to see the rapid trampling of these promises. A year later, the Yakimas attacked the white settlement at the Cascades of the Columbia, a single action in an ongoing war and the Cascades became entangled in the fight despite the treaty because they lived there, and they were pissed off. And whites had been settling where they didn't belong. Mary and her sisters, daughters of Thomas, would insist that their father was wrongly accused. But still, he was hanged. His family was enslaved by the Klamath Indians, later freed by a, during a US Army attack and taken to Fort Vancouver. The soldiers, in a baffling gesture, took up a collection of gold for the girls, feeling bad about what happened to their dad. I try to picture Thomas, but I will never find his gleaming eyes in a sepia portrait or his last words transcribed in a mass market paperback. I can make guesses about the aches of his guts as he stepped onto the scaffold, ready to leave a world quickly emptying itself of familiar men. His daughters and granddaughters would grow into a world full of settler men who would roll into the women's lives for a fertilization or a marriage, for long strings of nights dappled with whiskey and cards for the wife's trust land to be tossed into his debts as though it were a bag of beads, for the wife's shotgun stationed at the door to bar her hard-partying husband from entering, for her threats of suicide by knife and his wrangling for the blade. The women and the men stared each other down across a deep gorge, novices at everyday armistice. Five generations after Thomas was hanged for being Indian, being in charge, and being around, I took for granted my undergraduate university's commitment to cultural diversity and wailed about my schoolmates' bigotry. Thomas had to leave his girls in a land of true discord, 
I cannot know even a sliver of it. The story is in the details, the traumas, the histories, not the titles and labels we apply and try to pass down without context. I've been searching for the story, the whole beast, the blessing, the burden. Thank you. So, is it on? All right. It's on? Yeah. Yeah, good. Alyssa and I were asked to come up with a few questions for each other. And I actually want to scoot in a little closer to her so I can look at her while I talk to her. And we agreed that I would ask her the first question, which is this. And that is, oh dear Alyssa, books stop. Writing stops, but we do not. So since the time that you wrote your book, My Body is a Book of Rules, how have you changed? How do you identify now? Well, during the time of the writing of the book, it, it takes place mostly during my early 20s. And um, I'm 30 now. So when I wrote the book, I had a very fractionated sense of my ethnic identity. Um, I thought that I had to identify myself by, you know, every identity, every ethnic identity I knew of myself. So I was Irish, Scottish, Polish, Ukrainian, German, Dutch, Cascade, Cowlitz, Welsh, French. And I thought that's, that's what I was ethnically. And, um, but, I've really let go of that idea of fractionated ethnic identity because I, I realized I don't know what it means to be Scottish or Dutch. That, that really doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I do know what it means to me to be a citizen of the Cowlitz tribe. Uh, I know what it means to me to be descended from the Cascade people and I know what it means to me to be descended um, from Eastern European immigrants to Pennsylvania's coal region. And that, you know, learning has been a very involved process that has spanned my entire life of, you know, growing up being around my grandparents in New Jersey who have told me so many stories of the coal region. My dad and my uncle have told me lots of stories of the coal region. Um, participating in Cowlitz tribal life as a, as a citizen these past few years out here, um, you know, learning more from my mother and my aunts, hi Aunt Linda, um, about, <laughs> about, um, you know, about what it means to be Cascade and uh, what it means to be Cowlitz. And so I've also learned that, you know, the definition of my ethnic and national identities is an ongoing process, and that is important to me. It is not something that was frozen, you know, at the time of conception, this uh, creation of my DNA that, that I can, you know, I can go to 23andMe and, and find my breakdown and that'll be me forever. That is not how I, I feel about myself. Um, and it's a process that also has had a lot to do with um, the work that I do. I'm an advisor in the Department of American Indian Studies at University of Washington. Um, I, I taught there for several years and um, I'm now teaching at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Uh, and so forming relationships with, with other native peoples and with the um, creation of knowledge in those places is so important to me in, in learning who I am. So, um, so I have a question for you. Um, you write in, in your book about the awkwardness of being a Cowlitz and Cree woman while feeling pulled to remember. So I'm wondering how the process of writing the book changed that sense of being. So we've talked about this a little bit too. Um, 
Essayist Roger Rosenblatt once answered the question, why write? This way, he said, to make suffering endurable, to make evil intelligible, to make justice desirable, and to make love possible. And while that's a grandiose list, I love it. And I'd add that I write, and probably all who write, write to make the complex intelligible and to make our own thinking visible in such a way that we create ground. And then from that ground, things can grow. Many things emerge. Writing really helps to lay out a, a sense of things. Um, I began my book as a person really unsure whether to inhabit the Native American self to which I felt so palpably, powerfully pulled and really unsure about what inhabitants even meant. Um, for example, I didn't yet know the name of our language, which turned out to be languages. I couldn't repeat a tribal story. Um, I pulled smelt, but I didn't pull smelt in ceremony. And the list went on and on. And, uh, and I wanted to know, because I was told that I was Native American, but I wanted to know what it meant to be that thing. Um, instead of feeling apologetic about who I was, after I finished this book, it was like, um, like something that had been filled, like a vessel that had been filled. And then I felt entitled, and I felt articulate in a way that I had not before and it felt really good. And in the place of an absence of story, having written the book, there were many stories and many people and many histories. So in exchange for the book, I got a voice, a new voice. So, you ready for the next question? <laughs> All right. Um, you write in my body as a book of rules that Yes, I am Indian, but I am also very, very white. And I'd like to know more about that. Tell me more. <laughs> well, it's winter time, so you can see my winter skin. <laughs> um, so I'm an enrolled member of the Khalid's tribe. I am, so I'm a full citizen of the Khalid's tribe. And so that means that I, I feel that I in, inhabit my indigenous identity in one, in one way, that's one part of it. Um, there are many parts, you know, really a lot of kind of complex moving parts to my indigenous identity, but, but that's one of them. And, you know, at, at the same time, physically, I do have the appearance of being, being very pale. And um, so that's kind of part of what was going on in, in the book. At, at the time of the writing, at the time the memoir takes place, I was having a lot of confusion around trying to negotiate that. The fact that to the outward world, um, I, I, I looked white um, and I completely passed as white. And as a young person forming her identity, um, as you heard about in, in the selection that I read, that was really not just complicated, but, but troubling when I sometimes felt that there was judgment associated with that. Um, but I later came to learn a lot about the privilege associated with that as well. And there, you know, certain things, um, going down to Santa Fe and uh, teaching there and learning you know, how much different it is for me to take my rental car to Taco Bell in the middle of the night um, than it is for some of my colleagues um, when there's, you know, a lot of police around um, waiting with speed traps. Um, very different experience uh, because of the way that I pass as white. So, um, but then there's kind of more layers to that because it doesn't affect that, that passing does not affect the fact that I am, you know, a, com a completely a tribal citizen. It does not affect my citizenship in any way because indigeneity uh, is, has, is not affected at all by this notion of purity. There is, 
this notion of purity has no effect on indigeneity. Um, I am a completely an indigenous person, regardless of this um, outdated and ineffective no notion of blood quantum. So, um, I have a question for you. I just love to hear you say that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So, yes. Um, so you write about the threat to Cowlitz tribal identity brought about by the scattering effect of becoming landless. Um, so how do stories help to protect this tribal identity? I love that question. Also, uh, I want to clarify first that when I think of storytelling, I'm not necessarily thinking of lore or legends or myth. I think of stories as metaphor for transformation. I think of stories as the way we use narrative strategically and as a means of relating experience and history that moves across minds. So, because I think of storytelling this way, I think of stories as very, very deep. Um, and also really cagey, very slippery. Um, Vi Hilbert, an upper Skagit elder activist and linguist, we also talked about her today, said that storytelling allows you to heal, hear the um, soul and spirit of words. And I agree. Plus, stories build relationship and understanding. Um, Perhaps most importantly, when you are, and, and to your question more directly, um, minorities in this culture are so often isolated and deliberately, systemically kept from one another or kept from their tribe and their history, right? This is structural racism at work. And so stories, when we can get together and we can tell and share them, unburden each of us from this isolation. If we have stories that we share in common or we discover in common or strategies that we use in common, then we get to tell our truth. And this truth is both incredibly powerful and very disruptive. So it's also super reparative. There's just nothing like a great story. So when you ask whether stories will continue to help protect tribal identity, I emphatically, <laughs> you know, and un I give you an unqualified yes. Um, Kenneth Burke said that stories are equipment for living and that's how I think of them. They lay the architecture for our behavior and they also help to clarify and articulate what we really think and what we really feel and what we want to represent and share. So as long as stories live, we live. Thank you. That's a really exciting answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be up here with you. It's wonderful to talk with you. Yeah. Thanks. So do any of you have questions for us? <laughs> up there. So the question was about um, whether we participate in, in um, in wearing regalia? Um. Um, I can answer that, and I'm not the least bit offended. Um, absolutely, I participate in um, digging, root digging and root digging ceremony with the Yakima, and I also participate in berry picking with the Yakima, and that culminates in ceremony where you wear um, well, in this case, smokehouse or longhouse dress, so a wing dress, and the conical hat, I have one that's woven, and moccasins, and lots of jewelry. It's absolutely beautiful, and you dance, right, to celebrate and let Creator know that you're grateful for the Earth's bounty. You bet I do. And then another way that I wear regalia is I, for a long time, was in the employ of um, the Native American Youth and Family Center, which is a big nonprofit in Portland. I was on their director's team, and when I left, I was gifted a gorgeous honor blanket, and so on certain occasions, I'll bust out the honor blanket with my hat, and I'll wear that as well. As well. In urban settings, do you, do you all know that Seattle and Portland are huge um, they have huge native populations, and not just of people who are around here. Portland, for example, has 40,000 Native American people from like 
represented by 380 different tribes. So when urban Native Americans get together, it's very, very complex, right, and heterogeneous. And yet, there is regalia that we wear. There are things that we celebrate in common. So thanks for asking. How about you? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I do not wear regalia. Um, it's... Um, I, like, I really like your, your answer that you began by talking about ceremony. Um, the ceremonies that I have participated in are um, not, not in association with uh, any, do not have regalia, um, kind of like the demonstrative regalia associated with them. And so I, um, so I, I just don't, I don't have any regalia that I wear yet, but I'm a very young cowlitz person. And so I, I see that there will be a time in my life that I, I will, um, once I begin doing those ceremonies that, that are associated with regalia. Thank you. Other questions? That's a tricky one. Um, are there any cowlitz in the audience who wanna try yeah, I'm, I'm feeling like fishing and hunting Phil. is kind of a big deal, but Phil, what, would you like to take the mic and answer that? It'd be kind of exciting to hear from another Cowlitz person. Are you volunteering? Oh, sure. Um, repeating the question. The, the question was about the, the single greatest um, betrayal, broken promise to the, the Cowlitz tribe from the federal government. It's an interesting question. It's hard to pick only one, right? Probably for tribal peoples nationwide, worldwide. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Philip Haru. I'm the vice chairman of the Cowlitz tribe, and it's, it's an honor to be uh, just here to listen to our uh, young uh, Cowlitz uh, uh, that have, are so uh, well-versed in, in our history and our culture. Uh, I think one of the... the the history of the Cowlitz is a, a lot of betrayal by the federal government and by the United States and, and by the British way back when even. <laughs> and so you, you've heard some of the stories of some of the atrocities. I think the biggest, one of the biggest betrayals is some of the atrocities. The Cowlitz, in, and, and I, I know a great hero to the Americans is Abraham Lincoln. He was the biggest betrayal for the Cowlitz people. In 1863, he opened Southwest Washington to uh, donation land claims uh, and extinguished Cowlitz aborig aboriginal territory. The, you know, there was no treaty with the Cowlitz, so the Cowlitz were, land was taken without compensation in 1863, and Cowlitz off of uh, some of the prime real estate that they occupied at that time were, were moved, relocated, killed, their land was taken. So the betrayal, I think, was uh, taking their lands without compensation or without a treaty, and it's taken the Cowlitz 160 years to try to recover from some of that, and we're not all the way back, but the Cowlitz have succeeded, and, and, it, and as they have said in their stories, the, I think when they write the modern history of the Cowlitz, it is just short of a miracle that so few people with so few resources were able to regain some of their land, some of their culture, their identity, and their recognition, and so as I like to say, we are retaking Southwest Washington one parcel at a time. But we, 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 so the betrayal, I think, was back in, in the time when, when my ancestors and their ancestors, uh, they were killed and their land was taken from them. And promises were made to them to stay out of the Indian Wars, that they would receive a reservation. All of those promises were broken by the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. One of the hardest things, it was really heartbreaking for me when I worked at the Native American Youth and Family Center, I would tour people on a daily basis and inevitably someone would come in and say, I know that I'm from a tribal people, I know my grandma was of descent, but I don't know anything, right? And it's heartbreaking because that's not an accident. That is a fairly deliberate series of policy, right, removal and erasure that occurs for so many of us. So you're right. I feel incredibly fortunate that there are people who are still living who would, you know, talk to me or talk to us. One thing, do you know where your land was or what, you know, sort of the... 
Yeah, yeah, Montana and Canada. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think you should make a trip up to, like, Montana and just, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> so Michael asks, first he says that it's a very exciting time for the Cowlitz, and could we answer something that we've noticed that, you know, excites us? Yeah. You want to take that one? Yes, I like, um, we have a lot of occasions to come together to celebrate now, and I love that. I love um, getting together for, um, in late December, we had a celebration, um, you know, surrounding bringing the land into trust and everybody under a big tent and, you know, telling stories and just excitement and um, songs, stories, celebration, and just having a place for that. And we've had a place for that, but just knowing this is our land and being able to stand on it and, and knowing what that means was absolutely tremendous. And having more occasions to celebrate. Um, celebration is just such a special thing in a tribal community. It's, it, it, it's incredibly meaningful because there are the stories and songs and um, the stories have such history to them. Um, I just love that we have more occasions for that and they are so joyful. <laughs> 